All right, let's jump, jump into it. Uh, we are hopefully the last night uh, in our discussion of uh, marriage, divorce, and, and remarriage. And in particular, what we're going to be getting into is the, the part two of our question that was originally given in 1 Corinthians 7, which is about verse 39 and, and marrying a Christian or marrying a non-Christian. But before we get into that, I was asked to make a few clarifications. One of them uh, based upon something that we discussed last week, and then two kind of follow-up questions that will be clarifications of things we discussed as well. Uh, first of all, I, I want to, to make a clarification in that we were discussing if we had a situation where someone was uh, publicly in a, a marriage that was not acceptable on the sight of God, and we kind of discussed them and, and how they would be treated. And I think it's very important that we make it clear that in a situation like that where there was public sin, a, a public unscriptural marriage, that those people certainly would be allowed to come into the building. If it came across that, that we would not let them into the building at all to worship with us or even give them the opportunity then in that sense to, to be able to repent, that we would never do such a thing. We certainly would talk with them and plead with them for their repentance. And we would treat that just like any other sin that was made public. We would encourage repentance, but we would never tell someone in that case that they could not come into the building and worship with us. And that, that was brought up. And so I want to make sure that we clarify that and on behalf of, uh, of the elders. And if they you know, want to add or take away from, from any of that, they certainly can. Um, also, with regard, and I'll turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 6, kind of a follow-up question... 1 Corinthians 6, another quick clarification. And it's a clarification and a follow-up question. And one of the reasons it's a clarification is because apparently I kind of misconstrued uh, the answer to a question. The question was, that was verbally given last week, is our non-Christians amenable to the law of marriage, to that covenant law? And so uh, we got to talking about it, and I think I did not make it very clear, and there was some confusion so I want to clarify this and answer a follow-up question at the same time. 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 9. 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 9. Are non-Christians uh, amenable? In other words, does the law of marriage apply? Does it uh, bind upon those who are not Christians? 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Now the follow-up question with this is who are the unrighteous? Are the unrighteous Christians that have sinned, or are these non-Christians? All right. Now, the context, we didn't talk about this last week, but the context of chapter 6 and the previous verses is a discussion about what subject? Suing. Suing. Excellent. Paul's talking about suing your brother. brother. Suing your brother in Christ. All right. What's his uh, discussion about that? Should we do that or not do that, according to Paul's inspired writing here? Not a good idea. So in that discussion, when he says basically you're taking your, uh, your situation with a brother that you should be able to take care of, and you're going to put it before unbelievers in the courtroom and deal with this, and it's just going to bring reproach on the church. That's the general idea. And when you get to verse number 8, nay, he says you do wrong and defraud. You're making the church look bad in essence. Uh, and, and that your brethren that are being done wrongly. And so in that context, he says, Know ye not then that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, none of them shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified. So, Question, are the unrighteous here believers who have fallen back into sin, or is the unrighteous here, are they unbelievers, those who have not obeyed the gospel? Why, and, and with that, why or why not? Okay, unbelievers, why, why would you think that? I'm not saying that that's wrong. I just want to, to let's prove that. Miss Jeannie? Okay, excellent. Verse 11 there is, is a big key, right? Such were some of you. Now, the reason this kind of clarifies and gives us the answer is because he's contrasting the fact that they're what now? In the, in the present, they are faithful Christians at Corinth. In the present. But in the past, they were, they were lost. They were, they were sinners. They were unrighteous. And so, therefore, it seems that in verse 9, the unrighteous, therefore, would be applying to those that are uh, not uh, Christians. 
that have not become a Christian. And so he's comparing their actions and, and he's talking about the past and what you were before you became a Christian, a child of God. Notice he says, you are washed. What is that a reference to? Baptism. We're talking about when they became a Christian, not when they repented and confessed sin as a Christian and because they, were, they fell back into sin. This is when they became a Christian. You are washed. And so prior to being washed, there can be no doubt that they were, of course, unbelievers, non-Christians. And so since that is the case, in verse 9, when he calls these unrighteous people adulterers, what must then be true about these non-believers or non-Christians? If a non-Christian can be an adulterer, what's the necessary inference? They're subject to the law of marriage. In order to be an adulterer, what does that mean? What's taking place if you're an adulterer? You're breaking the bound of marriage. That's right. You're in a marriage and you're breaking it. And that's God's law. God's the one that calls that adultery. So for them to be an adulterer would mean that as a non-Christian, they were in fact bound to that law. And furthermore, in order to become a Christian, they would have to what? They'd have to repent. They could not remain in that marriage and that just be forgiven. They'd have to repent of that. They would have to uh, make the necessary changes in repentance in order for the uh, baptism to wash away their sins. I saw a hand over here. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to say, where there's no law, there's no adultery. Excellent. That's right. If there is no law, there is no adultery. Absolutely. Uh, And that's why this is such a critical point. Um, But it seems to me, uh, based upon these particular passages, uh, that it would apply. And, of course, many others. You look at Matthew 19, 9, and it doesn't say Christian such and such. It says whosoever. Right? Acts 17, 30, he commands all men everywhere to repent. Hebrews 3 and about verse 4, marriage is honorable in what? For Christians? In all. So if marriage is... So there's a lot of passages we could combine there, but, but the follow-up was, was focused here, and, and that's why we went there. One other clarification and follow-up, and then we'll move on to, our, to the next part of this. Uh, the second kind of question with that was, what does it matter if your paperwork uh, doesn't say adultery? Uh, that's the reason. Doesn't uh, God know your situation Uh, without the law recognizing the adultery. And and I think the reason, again, that we have to clarify, it was my fault again because uh, it was brought up about lying on uh, the the certificate in order to be kind. And and so I was telling you that you would never uh, lie. Again, that's situational ethics. There would never be a time in which you would purposefully lie and that would be acceptable. But let me clarify something. That does not negate the fact that whatever's on that paper is irrelevant when it comes to what happened. If you're divorcing them for adultery, and somehow on that paper it's, it's written as something differently, right? That is completely irrelevant when it comes to God. The, the law of this land does not trump God's law. In other words, if you were cheated on and you divorced them for adultery, no matter what that paper says, if you divorced them for adultery, in God's eyes you are free to remarry. So I, I don't want you to think that what I was teaching last week, uh, just to clarify, is that if for some reason that, uh, that paper doesn't say that word, that all of a sudden it doesn't, you know, it's not legitimate adultery and, and you don't have the right to remarry, right? Fair, fair enough? Does that make sense? All right, any other thoughts on those clarifications? Just, yes, sir. Really quickly. To add, Absolutely. Like to add, um, in support of the point that you just made, yes. we've gotten more, uh, as these laws have become more progress, progressive, in the state of Florida, there is no other ground that the law recognizes except that a marriage is irretrievably broken. That is the ground. That is the ground. That's what's going to be on so, the... Yeah. So you, you always, you know, God is always going to look at the situation for what it is based on what he said the standards are, not what some, some state legislature says. Very good. Absolutely. Yeah, great point. Yeah, what would you call it? Ir- irretrievable, irretrievably broken. Irretrievably That's broken. The broken. Now, That's the now, ground. Historically, yeah. they did have other That groups, option, yeah. But at some, some point in, this, in the 70s here in Florida... 75, 8, they said, let's not... Let's just throw all that at you. We're just going to say irretrievably broken, and and let's call it... There you go. So in in Florida, if you do that, that paperwork's going to say irretrievably broken. But that does not mean that... You don't have to go to a state that will do differently on the paperwork in order to to Mm -hmm. divorce and remarry scripturally. That certainly isn't the case. And if I construed that in any way, I certainly apologize. I saw another hand, I think, over here. Yes, sir, Mr. McDaniel.
Oh, man. That's a, that's a good question. Wow. Here's the reason he asked that question, and it's a, it's a great question to ask. The reason that the marriage is an adulterous marriage is, let me, let me put it this way, is the marriage itself, and when you say I do, do is that the adultery? Again, what is the definition of adultery? It's not the fact that you got married. It's, it's what, adults? It's that, that physical relationship. So you're constantly committing adultery in that marriage relationship. And so the question is, if you don't share the marriage bed, and you're in a marriage that's not acceptable to God, could you remain in it all, all for the kids' sake and just avoid that relationship? What do you think about that? It's an excellent question. Yes, sir. Okay, so even, even that being the case, even if they're not in a marriage, it, would it then be acceptable to, for them to be in that house together and just not share the bed? Would we, would we say that that would be acceptable? So why, I, obviously we would think not, but why not? What would, we, what would our biblical reference there be? Why not, Miss Susan? Abstain from the appearance of evil. Okay, good. First of all, there's a big principle there. Abstain from the appearance of evil. You, you, t <laughs> you take someone in that situation that's in the same home, and claiming by the laws of this land to be married to that individual, but they're telling you, they're trying to tell everybody and get it all out there to every member, you know, that we're not sharing the marriage bed. Would you believe them? It would be very, very difficult to abstain from the appearance of evil and to be in that situation. Certainly that's a stumbling block. believe them or not, but it is, a, you know, the appearance of evil. Yes. But, it, you know, our thinking... Is not God's thinking. Right, that's right. Our thinking and, and ways are not His. You always have to go to that. That's it. That's very true. Miss Beverly? It's the same kind of situation, isn't it? Yeah, especially, uh, you know, maybe it's a couple that's not as young as they used to be, and, and they may legitimately not uh, be, you know, have that desire. I've heard that that kind of leaves you as you, you get older, maybe, in some cases. But it, maybe, so, you know, I could see somebody bringing that argument up and that, you know, being, why are y'all laughing? <laughs> Miss, Miss Jeannie? <laughs> Right. So some people think that uh, you know that's that's a different issue from getting divorced alone. But you know, but if you get remarried, that that's when it becomes the problem. That's when it becomes, what yeah. Do you think about that? A great question, Matthew. Let's go to Matthew 19, and we'll we'll definitely see the answer to that one here. Matthew 19. Let's quickly we'll quickly look at this because I do want to get to the next next part of this, but that's a great question. In the case where you've got physical abuse, and, and by the way, some, some suppose that that's what was going on in 1 Corinthians 7. I'll reference that again in a minute, but uh, we don't know that for sure, but it certainly is a, something to think about. But Matthew 19, verse number 3, here's their question. Here, here's why, again, this is not Dalton's opinion. This is what uh, the, my Bible says and what Jesus says. Verse 3, The Pharisees came unto him, tempting him and saying to him, Here's the question. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? In that question, did they ask anything about remarriage? 
No, no they did not. Verse 4, he says, have you not read? Right? Let's look at the owner's manual, if you will. God made it. It's his uh, manual. He says, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this cause a man shall leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain or two shall be one. Look at verse 6. Wherefore there are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. What is Jesus' answer to the question, can you divorce for any reason? He says no. And so it's interesting because when you get to verse 9, Jesus gives supplemental information. Jesus takes it a step further. He says, in fact, I'm telling you that if you divorce for a reason that you shouldn't and you remarry, you're committing adultery. So if you divorce for a reason other than adultery, right, you can, certainly you could repent of that and, and just remain single, yes. And in, in the case of verse 12 there, this idea of being a eunuch, that would come into effect. However, could we say that God gives authority here to divorce for reasons other than fornication? What would the clear-cut answer be based upon Matthew 19? No. However, divorce is not an option. But when you get to 1 Corinthians 7, and you've got that unique case in 10 and 11 where you've got some situation we don't know about that arose, and he says, in that case, you may separate. Some propose, a lot of commentaries uh, uh, believe that the question was about abuse. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, we don't know. But what does he say there in 10 and 11? Do you or do you not have the authority to separate in those cases? There he says, absolutely. He's not giving you a new reason for divorce. It's, it's about, we, we studied that already, but what he is doing is saying you can carizo, afiemi, you can separate. And so in those cases, I think biblically, what we would say is, is you need to, to separate. You need to, you, certainly God would not expect you to stay in the household with an individual that's, that's doing that to you. And, and legally, you know, we could get into the details as far as, you know, a legal separation and all that, but um, I cannot sit up here and tell you that it is acceptable to divorce a person for abuse because my Bible doesn't say that. It's just not in there. Um, but certainly if that happened and you're in a situation where you did that, you can repent of that and remain single and, and be saved. Uh, now obviously you don't want to premeditate that you know, either and, and do it that way, but um, it's a difficult situation. And, and you know, we, we're about to talk about, well, that's one of the reasons to marry a Christian, but even in that case, people can change. I know that too. Carlos? Yeah, and ironically, you talk, the, 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 the issue in this question is about physical abuse or whatever you whatever Yeah, you call or drugs it. or, yeah. And ironically, uh, 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 in, in Matthew uh, 19, um, uh, 8, I think it is, he, he says, uh, they say, well, well then, if, if what you're saying is true, Jesus, then why did Moses tell us we could accept ourselves from this? And he says, uh, Jesus says, really because your hearts were so hard, because of the hardness of your heart. Mm -hmm. So who knows what, what those men were doing to their wives in that situation. But Jesus says, uh, yeah. you know, uh, uh, he says, um, Moses allowed you, and I'm reading in a different translation or ESV, uh, to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Yes. You know, and then he, and and then you've already said what God's universal uh, pr uh, uh, statement on marriage uh, is in the first place. And now he's he's telling them, and now he's saying, and I say unto you that whosoever do this, except it be the cause, there's only one reason. There's only one exception. No one exception to cause. Absolutely. The only one. Absolutely. Otherwise, you 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 have to <clears throat> violate the law. That's it. So he mentioned, Carlos is adding, you know, mentioning there that it is, there's only one exception law. And, and by the way, a, a further uh, addendum here, if the individual was able to divorce acceptably to God for abuse or drugs, what would then be necessary, the necessary inference for what he could also do? If you can divorce acceptably to God and he would recognize that, and you are divorced because of drugs or abuse, if that's acceptable, then you would inherently have the right to do what? Remarry, because it wouldn't be adultery if God accepted that divorce. So that's, that's a great question, and for that reason, that the only way that God is going to separate you, as it were, is going to be if there is adultery, and you decide in that case to, uh, to, to have that divorce. But it's, it's difficult, it is. Uh, yes, sir? We keep on saying on ground of adultery. Yes. Right. Yeah. 
You're, you're exactly right. That's a good point. I'm saying adultery, but the word is porneo, fornication, and which would include homosexual... Uh, well, there's a, I won't get into too much detail there. We've got a little, some young ones in here. But uh, the, the fornication is inclusive of the homosexual relationship. We'll just leave it at that. Um, uh, pedophilia, whatever you want to talk about. If that um, I word takes place, then, uh, then, then that's it. That's uh, fornication. That, that's covered. I'm so glad you brought that up. That's an excellent point. Yes, sir. Well, the, the, the two things there. Number one, if it's an unscriptural marriage, my question would be, why wouldn't God want you to divorce if that's the path to repentance? Uh, I don't, if it's an unscriptural marriage in the sense that it's an adulterous marriage, then uh, God would want you to divorce. There wouldn't be an exception to that. Um, I can't think of a case where you would be in an adulterous marriage and, and God would say, I don't, you know, I don't want you to repent of that. You know, it's, it would be acceptable not to repent, if that makes sense. Um, and... Uh, the second one you just said just left me. Uh, the um, oh, the Social Security, yeah. And, and again, you know, there uh, would if you if you've got a again that appearance of evil and a, and a bad image is taking place. And if I understood the scenario, then Social Security or you know, uh, my question would be: Would you want to stand before God and say, "Listen, I did this because I needed my Social Security," you know? And would you be would that couple be comfortable doing that? I would not. You, you see what I'm saying? I don't mean that in a in a in a bad way. I'm sorry. Wait till you get that situation. And hey, I, I, I'm glad he said that because I understand, you know, there's sometimes you get in a situation and, and you want to, you know, it's, it's a little tougher on you when you're in that situation. And I get that. I do. Um, it doesn't change the truth, but I, I certainly am not so arrogant to say that things like that wouldn't be tempted if I was in that situation. Tempting, I should say. Uh, Bill? Yes. Yes. And because they can't, that's why you have all the body of and if that did this, and if we done this, and if we had all these hypotheticals, yeah. and then the President of the United States to, uh, to go to a magistrate and say, it all depends on what is it. And when, when we get to where we're trying to parse words, I don't think that the disciples back there in that time when Jesus discussed this with them, that they were confused about what he said. Yeah, that's a great point. I don't think they were either. And all men cannot receive this saying. Yeah. That's it. And that's the point of it all. Just stick with the scriptures and, and, and don't worry about it. And, and speaking of that, something that will greatly help you stick with the scriptures is involved with the next part of this. Part, part two. Let me, if, if it's all right, if there's no uh, real important address uh, addendums to that, let's go to 1 Corinthians 7. And we can still talk about it connected with this. This is why, brethren, this is why we encourage our young people to marry a what? Christian. And I understand even, even Christians can change, and sometimes that happens. But statistically, you certainly are increasing your chances of not putting yourself in these situations when you marry a faithful Christian. So, but 1 Corinthians 7, the follow-up question with the 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband be dead, so again, you've got the, the other opportunity in which you may remarry. You're freed from that law, and she's at liberty to marry whom she will. But he doesn't stop there. No. He says, only in the Lord. And so the question is, does it mean you can only marry a Christian? 
in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 39. What do you think he means there when he says, you can marry whoever you want, only in the Lord? Do you think he's talking about a Christian there? Yep. Every, same, same here. When you look at, I mean, the, the, the commentaries, the denominational commentators and scholars are pretty much unanimous. I didn't find a single exception to that. But this is, when you see in Christ or in the Lord or something to that effect, what's, it, what's that referencing? Romans 16.2 is an example. It's referencing a Christian. And so Romans, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 7.39, he's telling them, if you get in that situation and you are free to remarry, then what do you need to do this time? Marry a Christian. It bothers me, and no offense if, if you're one of these, and I, I hope you're not, I don't want to offend you, but I'm going to be honest with you. It bothers me that people will go to 1 Corinthians 7, and they will say there's absolutely nothing wrong with marrying a non-Christian, because in 1 Corinthians 7, he says that you know when you're in that situation, you need to stay together. But the problem with that is, when Paul wrote that letter, he was talking to people who were already in that situation. 1 Corinthians 7 is not a case where you find Paul telling people, here's what you need. In fact, when he does finally say when you can marry, what does he say? He says, marry a Christian. So, now, I'm not necessarily telling you that to marry a non-Christian is, is, is a sin and you're going to be lost forever. We're about to talk about it. But at the same time, I, it bothers me that we would use 1 Corinthians 7 as authority to tell our young people, you can marry a non-Christian, don't worry about it. You can marry a Christian or a non-Christian, it, it doesn't matter, both are acceptable to God. We're, that's, that's really not, not good Christian advice, I don't believe. And, and it's, it's misunderstanding uh, what Paul's getting at. Paul's not happy about their situation. In fact, I think the, the reason they're asking about, what do I do in this situation, is because they realize they're in a situation they don't need to be in. They're in a situation where they're married to a non-Christian. Um, Let's look at some verses. I, I want to kind of couple 1 Corinthians 7.39 with a few other passages that I think will kind of help put all this together. I realize that in every congregation, including this one, there are those who originally married a, a non-Christian, and some of in those cases are now both Christians, and in some of those cases there are those who are still married to a non-Christian. And, and that happens sometimes. And when you're in that situation, the Bible talks about how to deal with that and what to do. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about, is it uh, acceptable? Is it uh, encouraged in any capacity? Or even neutral in God's eyes to marry a non-Christian? That's, that's the question uh, at hand. 1 Corinthians 7.39, we see they are referencing the fact that, that those that are going to remarry need to marry uh, those who are in Christ. Let's go to, to one of uh, the more obvious, or uh, I guess commonly used passages to talk about uh, marrying a, a non-Christian. We've got to be careful with this one because of the immediate context. But I still want to read it because it's often brought up and used. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Is it acceptable to marry a, uh, a non-Christian? That's what we're talking about. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Verse 17, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Is this context of 2 Corinthians 6 about marriage, first of all. No, it is not. It is not. I'm not going here because this is about marriage and this is going to answer our question. I'm going here, and by the way, one of the main reasons we can be sure this is not directly addressed to marriage is because of verse 17. What did you notice about verse 17? If this were about marriage, what would he be saying? Come out from among them and be ye what? Separate. Separate. If this was about marriage, he'd be telling people they need to separate in that case. Um, and that was not what Paul encouraged. Um, Paul said in, in some cases there is going to be that separation, not divorce. But he never encouraged that. And so in this case, uh, that would be encouraged. But that's not what's going on. This is not about uh, marriage. This is about uh, that relationships. And uh, you could talk about and apply this with the, the, the work atmosphere or friendships and those kinds of things. But what I do want to point out is there is a principle here that I think does apply. 
What is the principle behind 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 17? What is he saying about those relationships that you have in this world? You, you should try to sanctify them as best you can, for one. Mm -hmm. In other words, you, you should try to remain sanctified, is what I should say. Yes. As best you can, for one issue. And then um, try to um, have a, a, a bias toward doing things that will only lead to your spiritual development and not detract from your spiritual development. Yeah. That's the two, those are two of the things I see. Here. Absolutely. So you're trying to keep yourself sanctified and, and do those things that would not detract uh, from that. Yes, ma'am? You should have things in common with the other person. Okay, good. You need to have things in common with these relationships, with the other person. And in particular, what thing needs to be in common based upon these, your spirituality? So there's a principle here, and that is you're... you're primary relationships that you're maintaining don't need to be with non-Christians, right? He says, what fellowship has light with darkness and, and Satan with Christ? I mean, what, answer that. What, what fellowship has Satan with Christ? How much? None. Or the temple of God with idolatry. You know the, the, what was going on in the temple there in Corinth. What, th there's none at all. So he's saying that you don't need to, to be maintaining those relationships. And so there's a principle here. And so I, I would... I would at least bring this application from it. Would we not somewhat apply this to the greatest relationship, the closest relationship you're ever going to have with anybody on, the, on this planet in your lifetime? Would there not be at least a principle there that you would want to spend that with someone that you have in common with, that most important thing of spirituality? Would you agree with that? We can at least draw that principle. Let, let's go to 1 Corinthians 9. Now. I want to show you a passage that isn't as common, and that I believe is, is more of a, a better biblical argument to talk about. Basically, I would ask this question. Do we have authority to marry a non-Christian? It's kind of the way I would put it. And the reason I ask that, do we have authority to do so, is because of 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 5. Very quickly, our time is almost up. Paul is talking here about, remember, his freedoms, his authorities. And he's talking about, this is where preachers uh, have the... Uh, the right to, to receive payment, right? You can pay your preacher. That's biblical authority, 1 Corinthians 9. And so he, he mentions ver 9 verse 1. He's, he's telling them all his authority and freedom. I'm an apostle. Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus? Verse number 4, have we not power to eat and drink what we want? Look at verse 5 though. Have we not power to lead about a wife? I skipped something though. What does it say? A sister. ESV, I believe Carlos said he has. What does yours say there? Believing wife. Yeah, believing wife. Paul, in speaking of his freedoms, says, I have the authority, if I want, to marry a Christian wife. It's very interesting to me. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 5. Paul did not say, and by the way, he's just been discussing the other apostles and brethren uh, as well. Verse 5. As well as the other apostles and the brethren of the Lord and Cephas. Right? Of all of us, we have authority. He doesn't just say... It's just interesting because he's, he's showing his freedoms. He's opening it up to... He's not narrowing it down unless he has to. And he just happens to throw in there, I've got the authority to marry a believing wife. I think that's interesting. Something to think about. One more passage. Malachi chapter 2, and, and we're going to uh, leave this subject behind. Malachi chapter 2, but hopefully... Uh, to God be the glory, of course. Hopefully uh, we have covered it uh, as well as it needs to be at this point. Malachi chapter 2, three weeks, we, we did all right. Malachi chapter 2, verses 11 and following. One other thought here about this. Malachi 2, 11. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel. By the way, in the Old Testament, true or false, God made it very clear that they were not to marry outside of Israel, and to do so would estrange them from their Lord. Very true. As far as the nature of God is concerned in the Old Testament, He made that clear. In fact, in Ezra 9 and 10, and by the way, if you ever wanted to find a place where God commanded divorce in an unscriptural marriage, it's Ezra 9 and 10. And the reason He commands that divorce is because they married non-quote Christians. They married those outside of Israel. God has always been very serious about marrying and that, that marriage bond. He does not want divorce, but He commands it in an unscriptural marriage. And so no wonder they would ask that question in 1 Corinthians 7, right? Do we need to get out of this marriage? And Paul would say no. But all that aside, 
Judah hath dealt treacherously, and that's exactly what's happened here. An abomination is committed in Israel and Jerusalem, for Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord which he loved, and he's married the daughter of a strange God. He married someone outside of Israel. In fact, you're going to notice he left his wife that he had in Israel and married a, an unbeliever. Let's, for time's sake, jump down to verse 14. Yet you say, why? Because the Lord hath been witness. Why are you going to receive this punishment? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. Don't miss verse 15. Circle it, highlight it, remember this. Why does God want two Christians to be married? What's one of the main reasons? Verse 15. Did He not make you one yet? He had the residue of the Spirit, and why one? Why did He make two people in Israel one? Why was that His will? That He might seek a godly what? A godly seed. What does that mean? Offspring. Offspring. Because God wants godly children. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For the Lord God of Israel, and there's the famous verse, hateth putting away. Malachi 2.16, God hates divorce. So, I say all that to say this. It is in the nature of God, it was at least in the Old Testament, for Him to, to not, absolutely not like by any means those marrying uh, those who were an unbeliever. And one of the reasons it was so important to God that two individuals marry within Israel is so that their children would be what? They would be faithful. Is it possible to have faithful children when you're married to a non-Christian? Yeah, absolutely, it is possible. But why would God not advise that? Why would God not appreciate that? Because it's a lot harder to do. If you think of it, listen to me, one of the most selfish things you can do is to, and, and forgive me, I know some of you, we all, we've all made mistakes, but when you marry a non-Christian, you, I think you would admit at that point in time, you're probably not thinking about those future children because you're going to make it so much harder on yourself, if the person doesn't obey the gospel now, to bring them to the truth. So, so very critical. Matthew 6 and verse 33, last point. Can you really be seeking God first and the kingdom first? Can God be number one in your life when you make the decision to start the, the, the strongest relationship you'll ever have in this world with somebody who doesn't even care enough to become a Christian? Just some things to, to think about. I know some of you have, 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 are in that situation or were in that situation, I, and I, I know that. I don't mean any disrespect. I, I love you very much. And you know what to do. You, to, to remain faithful, be a good example, and do all that you can to bring them to Christ. And we pray and hope that's exactly what will happen. I can't imagine how hard that is. But for our young people, I know everyone in this room would agree, no matter what your situation is, and then I'll hush, for, for our young people, we want them to marry a Christian. Amen? We want them to marry a Christian. Amen? Amen? All right, thank you. You better believe that. I know that you do. I know that we want that. God bless you. We'll, we'll pause for a moment and then uh, conclude with our invitation and song and prayer.